Hello, world. You're listening to Social Tech On Air with your host, Clint Post. And this is my 10th episode. I made sure that it was a special one. I got to interview Mindy Weinstein. Mindy Weinstein is a digital marketing strategist and an SEO trainer and professor. She's been in the industry for a while and is one of the the authorities that gets picked up for a lot of tech conferences to be a keynote speaker, to share her expertise in SEO. SEO is, is search engine optimization. It's what makes your search experience on Google magical. In other words, how and what you consume is all geared around this idea of search engine optimization. And as a company or business that's managing online presence, this is everything. And especially if you're into any kind of online marketing. Mindy shares some of the gems and insights of SEO marketing that that I think are invaluable. And I'm excited to share it with you. I'm excited for you to be able to learn a little bit more about how technology is shaping your life and how you consume information based off from what Google says is the best content for you to consume based off from what you search and, and what you have searched in the past and how websites have been designed to meet those different criterias to land on that first page. And Mindy also talks a lot about uh, how she personally uses technology and, and how she uses it in her family. And there were some amazing things shared there. I'm excited to share this episode with you. I hope you enjoy it. Be sure to share this with your friends. Leave a, a review and a rate it if you can. Subscribe on, on iTunes. And I really appreciate you taking the time to listen. I hope you enjoy the show. Welcome to the show. I'm sitting here with Mindy Weinstein. Did I say that right? You said it correctly. Yes, you did. Awesome. That's <laughs> one of my biggest fears when I do interviews that I'll botch the name. And we're actually just going to dive right into it. Have you give us an introduction to yourself and, and a little bit about, about your, your background. And, and then we'll dive deeper. That sounds great. So do you want me to start? Then I definitely will tell you a little bit about about me. So I currently run a digital marketing agency in Scottsdale called Market Mind Shift. But I've actually been in the digital world since about 2007-ish, around there. So quite a bit of time. But even before that, I was in marketing. So I am a marketer by heart. But the technology side of things have really drawn me to digital marketing. And on top of running an agency, I also teach part-time at Grand Canyon University. So I'm one of their marketing professors there, too. It's pretty fun. How long have you been teaching at? So I've been teaching at Grand Canyon. This this year is my first year. And so I started in the fall. And so this is my second semester. But I actually taught at a university in California for two years. Same thing. So marketing courses there. I actually created an SEO course. There, really? which was really cool and I had some students that actually went into that line of work after taking the class wow. so it's amazing that's awesome thank you for the introduction we're going to be talking about things about uh, SEO social mm-hmm. media uh, education what you're teaching and, and how that works a little bit about your PhD in psychology and technology yes uh, and some of your effective uses of technology in your personal and family lives and obviously what uh, what you've liked about technology throughout your life. So I think probably the best place to start is let's let's get a feel for your expertise. What's some companies that you've worked for? Oh, absolutely. So um, I have worked, before starting my own agency, um, I worked at two different agencies over the years. And one of them, um, we worked with lawyers and doctors, was our main focus. And I was there for about five years. And... When I first started, just to give you even a little bit more insight into my journey, so when I first started, I came into the industry as a writer. Mm -hmm. Like I love to write, and so I thought, you know, that would be something I can do, and I enjoy it. And I started writing for websites, but I got hired on from being a freelancer to being an employee of this agency. And within a few months, they said, hey, would you 
take over our content department, and there was about four writers. I'm like, yeah, that'd be great. <laughs> And then by the time I left five years later, there were 40 writers and editors. And then I also took over the SEO team. That's where things got interesting. So I came in with my marketing brain, very much like a right brain type person. Like I love creative. I love all that. And then I thought, well, the SEO seems very interesting. You know, that's where so much, so much of marketing is SEO. And we can talk about that in a little bit. Yeah, yeah. And so when the opportunity arose that, hey, I could be on the SEO side of that company too, I jumped on it. And I mean, I literally like jumped in head first. So that's like, if we want to tell those stories later, we can. Yeah. But from there, I got recruited by another company um, called Bruce Clay. And um, so when I was there, I was the SEO manager. I was there for a few years. And also, I was doing the SEO training. And so to date, I've actually, just to give you an idea of how involved I am with SEO, so I do training still. And I trained people from Facebook how to do SEO, from HBO, from Fandango, from Rosetta Stone, from Telemundo. <laughs> that was fun to say, but a lot of different companies. So it's just really amazing because you can see all these other people in the tech space. And so some of them that come in, they have no knowledge. And some come in with a lot of knowledge, but they don't understand like the whole search side. So mm -hmm. my background goes back pretty far, but um, I love it. And what I love so much about what I do is that every Monday, I feel like it's a new industry. Like Google has changed something. There's like a new <laughs> social network, like something's new, but it yeah. keeps you on your toes. And um, I love it because of that. awesome. So do you consider yourself ambitious or, or how did you go from, from coming in as, as like a, a hired writer to running 40 people to write content? Yeah, I've been called ambitious in my day. I mean, okay. definitely. And it's funny because the first time I ever was called that was at that agency. I'm like, wow, you're so ambitious. And I, at first I thought that was more of like, it wasn't a compliment. And the more I thought about it, I thought, no, no, it's, you know, it's the same thing as being driven. And so... I mean, anything that I've ever gone into, I go in like full force with my whole heart into it and just pour everything into it. And so I was so uh, wanting to learn mm -hmm. that um, it made it really great to move forward. And what's interesting is, um, so I went to a conference last last week and yeah. Steve Wozniak was there. So he was the keynote speaker and I mean, he said tons of great things. But one of the things he said, and this actually goes back to the question you asked me, he said that it's more, uh, what did he say? Wanting is more important than knowledge. So wanting is more important than knowledge. And so wanting something is more important than actually knowing it yet because you'll figure out a way to get there. And so I feel like throughout my career, like when I jumped into the SEO side, I'm like, well, I don't really know that side, but I want to know it. And yeah. so I just, I jumped in and then I ended up meeting Bruce Clay at a training and then I was recruited. So it just, Anyway, that was a cool line, so I'm stealing it from Steve Wozniak, but it's a good mo motive, or well, good uh, motif. <laughs> yeah, you, you, you cited your source on that. Right, so. <laughs> we're okay there. <laughs> now, you participated not just as a, as a uh, sitting and listening at this conference, right? Oh, I spoke there too. Yeah. So I spoke, so it was the Digital Summit, I actually speak at... Um, I spoke at one in Dallas, and I'll have a couple more coming up here. But I did. I did a session on um, keyword research and intent behind searches. Mm -hmm. So something I'm very fascinated about. And then um, I'm also doing an SEO workshop for the Digital Summit in uh, Seattle coming up and in uh, Los Angeles. What's the tickets to these events? So those Cost. ones, I, okay, so I believe they're around 300 to 400 depending right. on when you buy it. Because sure. they have early bird pricing and all that, too. All right. But well, I... You want to check it out, so don't quote me on that, but you want to check it out. <laughs> well, I'm just wondering how valuable this interview oh. is and what I'm going to have to <laughs> be very grateful for here. <laughs> I appreciate appreciate your time here. And SEO, so what year was this when you, when you became kind of that second position that you mm -hmm. got strictly on SEO? What year was that? I think it was 2010. 2010? I believe it was 2010. Trying to go back in the, okay. in the cobwebs in my brain. Um, so, But things have changed a lot. Right. So I was going to ask that. What did SEO look like then? Okay. So I can even tell you even before that. So when okay. I came in as a writer, so you have to understand SEO, there's a very technical component of it. Then there's the more marketing component, which is like the content you see on the website sure. and all that. Actually, thinking about it before we actually dive any deeper. Let's define SEO. Okay, just right. In case. Let's do that. That's a good idea. So yeah. SEO stands for search engine optimization. And 
at the most basic level, it is a process that you go through to get traffic to your website. But it's traffic from the search engines, so from you know Google, Yahoo, and Bing. So they have certain guidelines that um, they publish, and it's following their guidelines and making your, your site a good site, a high-quality site, and so you naturally get traffic. Mm -hmm. But there's certain SEO aspects that you do. And so like when I, um, going back to your question of what changed, like when I first got started, um, without getting too technical, like mm -hmm. there is something known as metadata where you create a title for every page that's on the website, you create mm -hmm. a meta description, and there was also a meta keywords tag. And um, all of that helps the search engines understand what the page is about. Well, when I first got started, that meta keywords tag, because it was really meant to just be a list of words that that made sense for that page that were relevant. But when I started, I was pretty much told as a writer, hey, can you do, um, it was pretty much equivalent to two Word documents full of just keywords, just keyword after keyword after keyword to basically stuff that tag with as many keyword variations right. as you could do. You don't do that anymore. <laughs> like, that's like a no-go. There you was also for that, right, right? You, get, you actually can get hurt for that. And yeah. um, there's a lot of what's called article marketing back in the day where you would write an article and you would submit it to uh, a there were article marketing websites. I'm trying to remember some of them. And what would happen is you submit it there and they spin it out to a bunch of different websites who want free content. And it's great for you because you now all these websites are linking to you. Mm -hmm. That kind of stuff doesn't work. That changed quite a bit because that's now duplicate content and mm -hmm. actually that hurts you too. So there's just so <laughs> many different things that were done back then. Now it's very much a, um, to me it's more of a holistic approach. It's mm -hmm. It's marketing, so it's starting with understanding who your audience is, because then you understand what do they search for, what do they expect to find, and what's gonna interest them. Mm -hmm. So that's the marketing side. And then the technical side is let's make sure our website is going to accommodate the search engine so mm -hmm. they can actually find the pages. So it's just changed, and to me it's changed for the good, yeah. because it's not like these, I don't know. Like I used to refer to them as like the like the magic, you know, that was done behind the scenes where no one understood who wasn't in SEO. Now it's more transparent. It's like, hey, this is what we're doing. You know, it's very natural. So I like the way it's gone. <laughs> That's good. Is it more work or less work than before? Um, it's more work. It is more work because before, like, you could just. You know, people would just like create, like I said, create an article and just put it out there and done. Mm -hmm. Now they've got all these links to their website. So there's a lot of little techniques like that that people would do and they would get a boost. And so all of a sudden their, their pages on their website would show up higher in search results. Mm -hmm. So it's not as easy anymore. But again, um, it's, you know, it just goes back to, again, the whole natural thing. Because really your goal should always be to have a website that people are going to love anyway. Right. So when they get there, it's going to have what they need versus the trying to trick your way to the top situation. Uh, so the people that find your site now versus then, is there a difference? It's, so Google has gone to great lengths to demote websites that we're doing. Now there's a lot of those are spam tactics too. And so there's a lot of spammy things people used to do. And so Google has come out with penalties. So understand too, Google ha and all the other search, I say Google, even though there's other search engines, like we'll, Bing we'll does exist. Google, <laughs> aka search right, engines. Right, right. But they have algorithms, which are just you know mathematical formulas they use to determine what pages are gonna show up. And so like Google has now wrapped different penalties into their algorithms. So like if you do anything that's a little bit spammy, well, they're gonna weed your site out. It's not gonna show up. So as far as like a search perspective, it's better results. And so that's the thing, Google, I mean, they've got a lot of money, a lot of money. And they're, those search results I'm talking about, it's organic. They don't make money there, but yet they spend a ton of money to protect it. And they've got all these PhDs working for them. So they want to make sure that there's a good user experience for someone sure. who does the search. So basically, the sites that are coming up on the first page, you can say they're going to have a good experience. Good experience. That's Google's goal. Yeah. And so as a designer, you want to make sure that you provide a, a good experience for your absolutely. market if you want to show up on that first Right. Page. Absolutely. Now, Google is very much into speed because okay. more searches are on mobile devices than are on sure. desktop. And so like they've come out with something called... Um, the AMP project, so that's yeah. accelerated mobile pages, yeah. and so and it's just to speed up the environment because we have changed as searchers and, and people, you mm -hmm. know, and what we do, and so they're trying to make sure that they change with us. Sure, I'm sure a number of listeners are listening to this on their cell phones at right. and and probably searching something on Google. As exactly we talk. <laughs> on your phone because that's right. what you do, right? Yeah, it's all right there. What uh, social media, the Facebook, Twitter, a lot of these different um, big platforms, mm. how do they affect SEO? 
So they're separate. I mean, so there's SEO and there's an algorithm for that, but then there's social media. And so there's been a lot of questions like, does social media impact what shows up in search results? And there's a lot of theories. Google's come out and said not directly, but we know that like if there's like a company that a lot of people are talking about, like on Facebook and they're tweeting about it and they're talking about it in social networks, that there's got to be some kind of like buzz factor or something like that in there. But what it really does to me, social media, as far as like a business side goes, it's very much branding and it's awareness. And so it's getting people aware of your existence and what you do. And it gives so much of a personality to a brand that never existed before. I mean, you think about in the past, it was when there was communication, it was one-sided. You see a commercial, it's one-sided. You can't talk back. Well, I guess you could, but it would be kind of weird <laughs> talking to your TV or the radio. Right. Now it's a communication. And so, you know, like people do it all the time. They'll, they might have a good experience and they'll tweet about it, but usually it's they had a bad experience and they tweet about it. And then you get a response. There's actually a live person. Yeah. And then, you know, these companies are putting out information via social media, but it gives them an outlet to their customers that never existed prior. Sure. So we're going to keep touching a little bit more on SEO, but I'd like to know, you had your second job and from there you moved to starting your own company? Mm -hmm. So I am. Um, so I was with Bruce Clay, I was with that organization for a few years, and actually I still do Bruce Clay training, mm. um, but just because of a lot of travel, and I just ended up um, starting branching out on my own, So because I have two kids, and so I was getting to the point of watching them cry on the driveway, yeah. um, just wave as I left, and so I ended up just branching out on my own, and um, so I do like SEO, I love SEO, mm -hmm. but the social media component's a big part of it too. Okay. And... What's the name of your company? So it's Market Mindshift. Market Mindshift. Mm -hmm. And what are some of the companies that you like to work with under that? Oh, absolutely. I actually, the best scenario um, that I've had is companies that they already have some marketing expertise. They might have the personnel or another agency that they're working with that's doing more of the traditional side. That's like the perfect, perfect client because then I can come in and I can add the digital components and so many people don't understand that side of it. And so businesses, I mean, as far as the size of the business, I mean, it could be a small business or medium sized business, but having um, that person at the talent that understands the marketing side, and then I can bring in like the SEO and the social media. It's just a great, great mm -hmm. uh, position to be in. Cause that's the thing is that even though I'm very much on the digital side is you know, there's still like traditional marketing avenues that work. But when you bring in the whole online component, that's where it just gets so powerful. Mm -hmm. And so, and I'm going to get off on a tangent a little bit, <laughs> but you know, there's a statistic, um, I don't remember the exact figure, but it's very high of the percentage of people that will see like a commercial, so a TV commercial, and then they grab their phone to look it up. Sure. I mean, you think about that. So our behavior so much is like intertwined in how we live yeah. in, in our technology. So I love that side. But going back to the so companies that have those people that are also doing traditional. Okay. So, uh, you know, along those lines of statistics, I think about, for example, something like Pinterest and mm -hmm. Instagram that are really a, a visual image, sometimes right. moving image type thing. But the people that use it, the majority of them go to that platform to look up research, to learn about products. Absolutely. And if you're not on the platform and your competitor is... right. Now, that's a huge thing. And actually, Pinterest is one of the largest search engines for women. Yeah. I mean, it really is. And Pinterest has a very long shelf life. Like, if you tweet about something, I mean, it's still going to be on your, your wall or your uh -huh. page, but it's going to be, like, pushed down. Okay. And then even Instagram, it's there, but, you know, it's among a lot, and you kind of lose some of the some of the initial result that you got because of that particular post. But with Pinterest, mm -hmm. if you have something and someone pinned it and then someone repins it, then all of a sudden you've got this uh, new audience. You get new traffic. So, I mean, you can get you can get awareness a long time on Pinterest. Ah. I'm going to have to make a disclaimer here. It sounds like you're doing construction. <laughs> I know, it does. Year. It does. <laughs> I apologize to our <laughs> listeners. But the content's brilliant. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> I think it, it overcompensates right. for that in, the, in a large way. So give me a little bit more about social media. What's a, a case study? Uh, I would be interested in this. So a company that you've worked with, they had a marketer, mm -hmm. they did what they could, mm -hmm. and then you were able to step in and, and take over the, the digital marketing mm -hmm. aspect. 
Go. So, well, there's been a, there's been a lot of those. So let me think which one I want to do. Um, there was one that they had a very good offline presence. Everyone knew, knew who they were. I mean, in their industry, they were very strong, but mm-hmm. they weren't getting a lot of like the online traffic going to their website. So, I mean, with the online traffic, I quadrupled it once it got into the website and made the changes, added the content, and then increased the social presence too. Mm-hmm. So what that does is it's not just, okay, in this within this industry and offline people talking, that's great, but now it's people actually searching. And so very much turned into the online part of it of an inbound marketing um, approach. So inbound marketing is really what digital marketing is. And so like traditional, you are... You're putting out a press release, you're doing a TV commercial, a radio ad, and you are trying to get in front of the right people at the right time. When you are doing online marketing, it's the opposite. You are trying to set yourself up so that when someone comes and searches you out, they find you. And so the ones that um, I've worked with have done that. There's another company that um, I actually know I haven't worked, I kind of worked with them off and on, but they came on the scene very much um, going for the online approach only. And so they used social media. And so they used Facebook to start with the branding because no one knew their brand. And so they created brand awareness on Facebook. Then once that started getting traction, then they went to Instagram and started building up the presence there. And then as they were getting more momentum and people were going to their websites and it was just driving so much traffic, they made sure that they had the capability on their website uh, for people to actually pin their product. Mm -hmm. And so going back to what I was talking about with Pinterest, now they're getting the bulk of their traffic actually from Pinterest. So, I mean, it, it's powerful and it works. That's pretty neat. What, uh, what's some of the current tactics that people may not be aware of when it comes to SEO? This is going back to the search engine side okay. and driving traffic to the right. website. So, Okay, well, it's interesting because I'm going to sound like I'm counter- contradicting myself a little bit. Contradicting myself. It made sense, <laughs> it made sense in my head. All right, right, we'll go with either one. Either option works. <laughs> okay, so it is very much marketing, right? So I'm sticking with that, except that what people fall short of all the time is they don't look at the technical aspect of their website. So they figured out that, okay, I need great content. I understand that Google rewards quality websites. That I always use the analogy that they don't look under the hood. So, like, the outside of the car is amazing. Like, it's mm-hmm. beautiful. The paint job, the interior is nice. It's like a hot-looking car, except you open, you pop the hood, and it's, like, all corroded in the engine, and it just doesn't look right. So, that's a lot of times what happens with SEO of today is that people aren't looking at the page speed of their, their mm-hmm. site. How long is it taking? Because I said that's a big deal. Um, is the site mobile friendly? So just because you have like a responsive web design, it doesn't mean you're mobile friendly. And Google's come out and said that they're working on a mobile first index now, which yeah. means that they're going to look at the mobile page before they even consider the desktop page. Even if someone's doing a desktop search, they want to know the factors and like how that mobile page is, is doing. Mm-hmm. So um, looking under the hood, so page speed, and then so many people have like broken links and things that have just happened on their site after time. Mm-hmm. They have duplicate content because they don't know. You'd be surprised at how many times I find that out of like, well, you know, um, we have a content here, but then we also have it here. Or the other thing I hear is, Well, we knew we needed content, so we found this really great journal article, and we just put on our website, we copied it, but we did cite it. Well, Google doesn't know that. It's like a duplicate page. And so there's things like the little mistakes that people make, and after a while, it's like a snowball, and it's this huge snowball, and they're not able to get their sites ranking like they could because they're not even getting their sites, what's called crawled by the search engines, all their pages, and therefore it's some other pages aren't even in the index, which mm-hmm. the index is what, when you see search results, that's what you're getting. Yeah. So really, even though, like I said, it's very much marketing, I just notice that so much of the technical aspect people don't understand. Mm-hmm. And it's just, that's the first thing I look at. So any project I work on, I won't do anything until I do a technical audit. Sure. Because we can have great content, but again, if, if search engine can't get to it, like it doesn't do us a lot of good because no one's ever going to find it. Yeah. I mean, if you can't get found by the search engines, unless someone goes directly to your site, it's like you don't exist. Sure. It's pretty crazy. So uh, basically, like in sometime in the future, it could be that if you don't have a mobile friendly version of the website, Google oh. will stop there. They won't pretty much. It. Yeah. I mean, I kind think of, we're already kind of, I mean, you, it's getting there. It's getting there. Yeah. And you think about the user experience. What happens when you're on your phone and you get to a site that's not mobile friendly? Right. You're like, yeah, I'm not going to, I'm not going to stick around. 
Don't you know, want to zoom in. Exactly. That's what I was just going to say. You're like trying to maximize and right. minimize and scoop things around. No one wants to do that. This link isn't working. <laughs> yeah, maybe if I click on it harder on my phone, right. it'll work this time. Just crack the screen. Right. Exactly. Uh, what about uh, different templates? So, for example, like Wix or WordPress mm -hmm. and, and all these other companies mm -hmm. out there that are kind of a, here's a template, fill mm -hmm. in the blanks, put up your pictures. Right. So those are uh, content management systems, so CMS, and um, I like WordPress. So WordPress is a good one because it is search friendly. Now it is an open source platform, and so it's and because of so many sites being on WordPress, sometimes it is not sometimes it is prone to hacking more than other ones. But you just take those precautions. But very much WordPress is a good one to go with. And and what's great about WordPress is even if you don't have web developer skills or design skills. You can purchase a theme, which is really just a template. It's our fancy way of saying template. So you can purchase a theme or you can um, get a free theme and you can start there. So I like that one. Some of the other platforms are a little bit more challenging just because their code isn't as search friendly. So like I said, I'm a big fan of WordPress. Cool. What about the from a user side? What can, can we expect? Uh, if, if I'm, for example, I, I can see this being important to say I don't know much about coding or anything mm -hmm. like that I'm just a, a user mm -hmm. if you would but I want to make sure that what I'm searching for is good the contents real mm -hmm. that I'm getting the best out of what I'm, I'm consuming if you would right now that's good that's a good question and so just so you know and before I answer like Google actually has a, um, a document that they create every year called the Google quality rating guidelines mm -hmm. And they employ these quality raters. So they're people that they employ that go out there and they'll tell them what to search for and then they give a website a rating. And now that's not gonna make a difference necessarily on how that website ranks, but it gives Google an idea of how they're doing, like as far as quality goes. And so I'll tell you some of the things that they look for because I think from a consumer standpoint, there are things you wanna look for anyway. Mm -hmm. And so they tell the person, you know, do the search. Um, and the, one of the first questions is, well, how hard is it to get to the main content on the page? Like, is it buried down on the page? Um, who owns the site? So, like, what company is it? Do they have contact information? Because they don't have contact information. You know, that's that makes people wonder about credibility sometimes. And then, um, like, what other pages do they have on their website? Does it look like that there's what they call main content and supplemental content? And then on top of that, like, if you're not sure, so going back to how do I know if what I'm seeing is good or not. Mm -hmm. Google instructs these raters to, once they find a page, take the name of that company and then type in, just go back to Google and type that company name in review or mm -hmm. company in ratings or just type in their name in, in general. Actually, I think that's the big thing that they have them do and see what else comes up. Because if a company or a person is truly an expert, well, if you search just for their name alone without going straight to their website, they should be there. Sure. People, they should have had interviews. They should have been out there. So yeah. that's to be expected. And so going back to your question, what I do if I'm not sure about a website is I will look at who owns this website. So I'll look at the contact information. I will click around the site to see, well, is this, do they have ample information on here? And then if I'm really, like if I'm about to buy something, because that's when you really get sketchy. Like right. I've never heard of this e-commerce site, but wow, <laughs> their prices are amazing. Well, that's when you do what I was talking about. You just take their name and Google it and then see what comes up. Okay. So pretty interesting. And Google, like, so Google's working on improving the results, but sometimes, depending on what you search for, you just don't know. <laughs> right. Or if you don't use Google, some right. other kind of search engine. Right. The ones we're not mentioning. Duck, Bing duck, is go. great. Right. It's actually go. <laughs> Right, and Bing is actually really great. Bing's market shares, even though I keep talking about Google, it's just because they're like the big gorilla. Right. That um, Bing's market share has grown every single year okay. for the last, I think it's like five, six years, maybe even longer than that. Yeah. So last I looked, they had twenty percent market share. So and Yahoo, Yahoo, they've uh, they've actually they've been steady. They went up a little bit for a mm -hmm. while, so they um, they're getting there. <laughs> <laughs> they're, they're surviving. Well, what's interesting is you know Yahoo went public based on their Yahoo directory. Mm -hmm. Do you remember the Yahoo directory? So they had a Yahoo directory back in the day, and they went public based on that. But a directory is very much like manually controlled. You know, it's just different. And uh, they decided at the end of the day that it was better to have a search in index. They don't even have the Yahoo directory, so it actually died. Okay. It died very sad a couple, wow. <laughs> a couple of years ago. <sighs> easy come, easy go. You're right. I guess. <laughs> <laughs> what? 
I, I think one of the things that's always has become more apparent in the news is the idea of fake news mm -hmm. and satire news and how it's kind of bleeding in and being easily shared as if it were true. Right. Um, I'm curious about your opinion and that and thoughts. Uh, it happens and it's really hard because even that what I hear when, when you say fake news and all that is online reputation management that's what comes up and that's that is a challenge I mean I'm gonna tell you that's a challenge for companies or if you had some kind of bad press I mean you can appeal to Google like if you want something omitted from search results but it doesn't mean it's gonna happen mm -hmm. like if there's something you have there but it's usually most often your own page <laughs> if it's something you're like oh, I want this gone <laughs> don't have this in search results and um, that's usually what you see there but um, it's just being aware. I mean, you have to be aware. You want to Google your name on a regular basis, Google mm -hmm. your business name, know what's showing up. And then if there is something that's fake, well, address that publication specifically. Or if it's like going back to online reputation management, I'm kind of taking your question and like curving it around. Sure, sure. <laughs> but let's say like all of a sudden you were like, gosh, this is like a horrible review someone wrote about me. Like this is like, I don't even know. This, I don't understand. Like why did they say that? Yeah. Uh, you just respond, but you don't throw gas on the flame. You know, if it's Yelp or one of the other reviews, Use, right. you just you respond to it you know and you want to you want to handle it appropriately instead but right. you have to keep an eye on what's going on and so there's actually a lot of tools that help with that like you can even use tools there's one called socialmention.com right. and like just monitor what's being said on the social platforms or you can set up google alerts for your name or your business name so you know if something's showing up in google results it, it populates in your email okay so just staying on top of it but it happens i mean right. unfortunately it does happen Interesting. I've never thought about that uh, connection between the fake news and, and reputation mm -hmm. management. Right. Which is, that seems like a very big deal. Mm. I mean, just like you said with reviews and, and uh, it's kind of sad how many people, A, ignore reviews, mm -hmm. don't respond at all to either good or bad. Right. And it's just right missed opportunities right. And, and and damaging opportunities well and just them. comes down to like be a real person yeah. you know and then if you're working at a company or you are owning the company like just be a real person a real person commented you know or did a review be a real person back mm -hmm. again don't don't be aggressive if it's a bad comment but mm -hmm. i think sometimes especially like in the online world we get so desensitize the fact that we're all human beings on there interacting and so it's all like faceless and it's numbers and it's all of this and there's a lot yeah. of data and all that stuff but again there's someone on the other end of whether it was the other end of the screen whether mm -hmm. it was their ipad or their phone or their computer and so you can't lose that human element right where do you see seo going in the future so it's um well google so what you should know about google is that they are very much um interested in AI technology, so artificial intelligence. And so they refer to it as rank brain. And it is one factor of their algorithm, only one right now, but they're very interested in understanding users more, very interested in understanding the intent. So that like if you're doing a search for something, they want to know, well, what is this a search to buy something? Are you trying to know something? Um, what is it that you're interested in? So they're trying to understand you and they're trying to understand again more of the human behavior and so from an SEO perspective it comes back to we've got to get more of that marketing hat on of like okay well if Google's going that direction we have to have a little bit of knowledge on psychology too because if Google's going chasing the human psyche we need to be chasing that to an extent <laughs> at least so understand um, where they're going. And so they're like deep learning is something that Google talks about quite a bit. So that's what they're after. And I think we're gonna see even more of that as time goes by. I mean, an overview of deep learning. So deep learning is going, again, more of like the artificial intelligence where they're trying to understand um, understanding the human behavior, human searches. And so again, understanding how that works. And so the deep learning is the technology that they're using to do that. But it's very much AI is what it is. It's just one of the terms that they use. Okay. Psychology, actually this is probably a good segue into <laughs> um, what you do in, in education. Mm -hmm. You have a master's degree in? I have a, it's in business, so just general business. I got an MBA from ASU. Okay. Any particular focus that you did for that? No, I just did general. General. Okay. So I have a marketing undergrad, and so I wanted just the general MBA to get more of like the like overall business and more even though it wasn't a management degree, but understand like the higher, mm -hmm. you know, taking it to a deeper level, higher level, all of that. Sure. 
And you teach, what are you teaching right now? So right now I'm teaching promotions and advertising okay. at Grand Canyon University. And I, last semester I taught marketing fundamentals. Okay. So it's been great because what's great about this semester is that you know, there is a big component where I'm talking about digital marketing because there's a lot of that. But again, we can't discount traditional either. You know, they work together. They can play nicely together. And that's actually what I tell my students a lot. They can play nicely. There's yeah. not, it doesn't have to be one or the other, uh, but it's great. So how's that contrasting? Uh, obviously, you're teaching kids that, that maybe spent their whole life mm -hmm. on, online, and now you're trying to teach them maybe how to interact with people or, or what do you what are you coming up against here? so well it's interesting and actually they're very receptive so I don't feel like I'm necessarily having to come up against anything except sure. for what I always tell them and I did this in my last class of if, if they walk away with nothing else if they forgot everything else I said all semester I want them to walk away with one concept and that is how to understand your target audience uh. like I spend so much time on that of like and I bring it to the more real level for them too because you know they're not in marketing yet but I tell them okay but if you truly understand your target audience so let's say you're gonna go for a job interview mm -hmm. for an internship if you took the time to understand the company and who it is that's gonna be interviewing you mm -hmm. uh, what are they looking for what clients do they have and even if you looked up that person on LinkedIn who's gonna be interviewing you yeah. you got a little bit of insight into your target audience you know and, okay. and how important that is and so Going back to the element, like you said, you know, they're all digital and all that. You know, I am trying to get them to remember always you have to think about the other person. So sure. I say that a lot, person and the audience, and just a <laughs> reminder. Because that's how you're a good marketer, too. Sure. I mean, if you can understand who it is you're communicating with, my gosh, you go so far. It's the empathy component. That's true. I found that. I think just coming in with some knowledge allows the conversation to to skip a lot of that basic right. groundwork that right. they usually have to exactly and then from a, absolutely and then from a marketing perspective like whether you're doing something digital so like you're working on social media marketing or you're trying to figure out like a radio commercial well, when you understand the problems that someone's facing, you can then describe how you have the solution in a better way. I mean, it's just, it's, but it's something that, especially a lot of the students don't quite understand yet. So I feel like if I repeat it enough times, <laughs> it's going to stick. Because <laughs> that's the other question I always ask them, like, well, what problem are we trying to solve? Because that's a marketing uh, fundamental. Awesome. So to understand your target audience. What's your preferred go-tos for learning about a target audience? Okay, well, right now, I can tell you right now. <laughs> right Because I am, uh, because it changes depending on what cool tools there are available. Sure. So I, I tend to geek out on certain tools. So right now, Demographics Pro is one of my favorites. And so it's demo, it's a website, demographicspro.com. But what you can do is if um, you have, like, your brand and you have a social media following and you want to understand a little bit more about your audience, then you can just plug in your Twitter account, your Facebook account, and it actually tells you their interests. It tells you other brands that they that they like. It tells you what they talk about. It tells you a lot. So you'd be wow. amazed. Or if you don't know and you want to know about your competition, you can do the same thing. You can put them in there and get some insight. So there's that. And then there's like the traditional way too of actually just doing your research. And so because I'm working on my PhD, I, like, I feel like I always do my PhD talk of like, well, there's quantitative research and there's qualitative research. <laughs> right. And if you're going to go that route and you're really trying to understand and you do your qualitative research, in my opinion, and that's when you're, if you already have some amazing customers or clients, you, you can interview them, ask them some more questions to get to know them yeah. or um, do focus groups. I mean, that helps you. But if you're wanting a tool, yeah, Demographics Pro is pretty cool. Demographics Pro, demographicspro.com. I'm going to check that yeah, out. Yeah, it's very cool. That's cool. Thank you for sharing that. And PhD, you've been working on it for how long? Forever. <laughs> Is that the right answer? That seems, um, seems, or what seems it, real. Yeah, what it feels like versus the reality. I have two years. Two years. And, um, and, and supposedly I should have two more years left, but I feel like I, I don't see the light at the end of the tunnel yet. Um, so I'm working on a PhD in psychology with an emphasis in technology and learning. So uh, it's a, what's considered an out of discipline uh, degree because I have a business, like I had an, a business undergrad with marketing and uh -huh. then I had my MBA. But for me, I felt like 
you know, I understand marketing, I understand business. What I don't, the part that I'm lacking is the psychology aspect of it. I want to understand more about the human mind and how does that work. But because I'm in the digital world, I want to understand the impact of technology and learning is part of it. You know, like how do we learn now? Yeah. You know, because we're always learning as humans. It doesn't stop once you're outside of school. And so I decided when I saw that that was an actual degree you could pursue, I jumped on it. And so I've already been applying a lot of the um, psychological elements now, you know. And I mean, I joked, I love the program. It's just, you know, it's a lot of writing papers. A lot, <laughs> so, of, writing, a lot of reading. A lot of reading <laughs> and a lot of writing, but I'm able to, look, like, apply it immediately. Yeah. It's just, uh, it's, um, again, two years in, but it's been great. So are you pursuing it mainly just for the information, or do you want to go on and, and continue, like, Coming a teacher in, in higher ed, or well, um, so I would always like to keep my foot in the door on the university side because I just like I'm very passionate and I get fulfillment from teaching, yeah. and so I love being able to teach like a lot of these students who want to pursue marketing degrees. And the fact though that I'm still working, I actually bring a fresh perspective. So that's the part I like. So I always want to have both the, a foot on both sides of the world. So university, academic, and then also in the business world, but. Um, but, you know, I mean, one day when I retire, I'd love just to be a full-time professor kind of thing. So that's down the road. But I thought, well, why wait to pursue the PhD? Because I can apply it now. And I really want to understand, um, again, the psychology. Because I feel like, again, since that's the avenue that search engines are going, I want to make sure I'm there. Yeah. I don't want to be left behind. I want to be ahead. Well, it seems like a lot of this stuff, at least in the degree I've been working on, we don't have books. Mm -hmm. Because... As soon as they're written, right, it's old. <laughs> right, because that's the the rate of, of technology mm -hmm. and its and mm -hmm. its progression. What's some of the things that you've learned in your program that that you've been able to apply? Oh, absolutely. So, um, one of the things there's a lot of theories on social media and what gets people involved and like what and because I'm coming in from a marketing angle of like the consumer behavior side. And so one of the things that I've been studying is the um, subculture aspect or what's referred to sometimes as crowd culture. Mm -hmm. And that's and that's whatever you identify it with, whatever interest you have. So like you love photography. Well, I mean, I don't know. I'm just saying, that. let's say you love photography, uh, right? Yeah. Okay, yeah. good. That worked out. Yeah. But let's say you love photography. Well, you're probably going to seek out other people online who also love photography. And because uh, the internet has broken down the geographic barriers that once existed, you can form these groups. And so they're referred to as subcultures. Well, what's very interesting I've been studying is how do those work and how do people communicate? And and it's very interesting on um, the influence that those type of groups have on each other. So the individuals within them. And so from a marketing perspective, I've been studying that quite a bit because now I feel like there's so much noise online. Yeah. You know, how do you stand out? Well, you can do social media, but that's, I mean, and I do social media, but how do you get even more attention? And so it's finding some of those groups, but doing it in a natural way or you're building relationships or you actually have something that you can offer them yeah. so that's one thing that um, I've been learning recently and so I've been reading extra on it even now some of those classes are done just because I find it fascinating wow uh, attention that's I'm trying to think of, of who said it was it was actually before the internet but <laughs> essentially that the idea that attention would become mm -hmm. the most valuable mm -hmm. commodity that's so true. I mean, think about it. So like in my classes, I quote, uh, and actually I think it's outdated now, and I told my students that, but there's one research study that said, oh, we're exposed to 1,500 marketing messages every single day. Well, now they say it can be up to 3,000 to 5,000. We don't know for sure, but you think about it. Like, think about you get up in the morning and a lot of people grab their phones and a lot of them will go on social media. So you go to Facebook and you start scrolling. Mm -hmm. well, there's ads. I mean, right? You, just, you don't even count. Like, you don't think about it. So you're exposed there. Mm -hmm. You go online, you do a search, you're going to see ads. Mm -hmm. You drive your car, there's billboards. I mean, so you're at attention. How do you get someone's attention? Yeah. So that's, that's the challenge it's the, the most valuable commodity right. now if you keep eyeballs on the screen right. you're there <laughs> so what's obviously uh, you're learning about the psychology of, of interest based mm -hmm. communities mm -hmm. you would and and what gets people to meet in, in different subcultures uh, what's how are people finding these these cultures now? Are, or are these groups finding the people? No, I mean, people find them. I mean, you know, it's really what you search. Like, a lot of people will go to, um, okay, as an example, and it's actually 
when I have a family member who has a son with a, he's got a medical condition, mm-hmm. and so he um, she then she's a young mom, and so she actually because she was trying to do research on well, what's the best doctor, you know, what should I do, and so she started doing searches online and then found communities that way. She also took to Twitter, and this is actually where she, where she found a lot of the groups. So she went to Twitter and she did a hashtag search for that condition, and I don't know the exact variation. She told me, but all of a sudden she connected with all these other moms with babies with the same condition. And so, I mean, with that, it's just like, then she joined these online communities because she was telling me all this information. I was like, how did you know that? And she goes, oh, it's from these other moms I've connected with. And I'm like, well, how'd you, you know, because then then I get into the online part. I'm like, well, how'd you find them? (laughs) And so that was just one example, but you, people search them out. Yeah. So a lot of these... uh... (laughs) Is it more platforms create the the space? Mm-hmm, exactly. And then people can find each other in that right. space, or or they find each other on Twitter and they say, "Hey, why don't we create a group here? Right, a Facebook group. Or right, a, people have Facebook group. Yes, or whatever it's going to be. Right. So some of that, absolutely. And then there's also like online forums. There's yeah. there's still those. I mean, forums we don't. So. I know we don't talk about them that much, but there's a lot of them. So this is just a goofy example, not as much of like a working with a client example, but my son's a hamster was sick. Okay. Okay. This was like two weeks ago. So I searched like hamster, I forgot what I searched for, and I literally found this community of hamster lovers. And I think they call, it was called I Love Hammy or something, and I don't remember exactly, but I was like, wow. It was like this whole online forum like with recent threads and everyone's wow. talking about their hamsters. I actually found the answer I was looking for. I nursed his hamster back to health, like spent an entire weekend giving this thing like water and Pedialyte because she had just like stopped drinking her water with a little, um, with a syringe is what I was having okay. to do. But I got that because I went to this forum and I just thought to myself, see, there's, there is a subculture for everything, everything. even for people who love their hamsters. Yeah. Seriously. You get three people that, that are interested in the most abstract right. thing, they'll find each other. Right. No. Wow. Let's uh, segue a little bit into your personal life with technology mm-hmm. and uh, so you have a couple boys, 11 and 8. 11 and 8. And since you're so involved with, with technology, how do you navigate the technology with them? I know. It's hard because I do talk to other parents that are like, well, I don't even allow screen time is what they refer to it as. Mm-hmm. And um, I'm not of that mindset because I feel like that is where the world is going. They need to be able to navigate devices. They need to be able to work computers and all of that. Mm-hmm. Um, I monitor it, that's for sure, and I scare them to death because I let them know that anything, you know, I have them in the room with me, but like yeah. anything you're doing, you know that there's a history. Yeah. So there's they like, and so they're a history, you know, <laughs> and so that's, I monitor it that way because I go through and I can look at browser history, but yeah. um, I do allow them to use devices because I want them to be familiar how do apps work, yeah. you know, how... And like my oldest son here, he has to do reports here and there. He's in fifth grade. Well, I sit down with him and we do a Google search. Like I want him to understand how that works because that is the world that they're going to live in. Mm -hmm. It really is. And so, I mean, one of the other things like with my oldest son, I even had him go to a coding class. Mm -hmm. And because I want him to learn like programming language is a language and it's, it's growing, you know, and just understand how everything works. So even my sons, they're funny. Like I, because I think it's really cool. Like, I'll pull things up. Like, here, this is what the website looks. This is what you see. And then I'll pull up the source code. I'm like, isn't that cool? And then now at this point, they just roll their eyes. But I want them to be immersed in technology. Because it's just going to be even more. Like, I actually talk to my boys a lot about it. Of Like, I've been talking to them about virtual reality. Because I feel like as they grow up, there's going to be so much virtual reality. And so I've been explaining that to them. So they're, whether they're, you know, some of it they're interested in. they They humor me. But... I'm not opposed to having them involved in technology. I just have to monitor it. That's the thing. I don't let them on social networks. That's the one thing. No, they're not. I haven't gotten to that point. I'm not comfortable with that yet. Yeah. Just because, well, they're still pretty young. Do you have an age where it's like, uh, they can get a Facebook? I know. Um, <laughs> not yet. <Yeah. laughs> I mean, we had an age, like my oldest son, we finally got him a phone. Like uh-huh. he had a flip phone. Okay. for a while and apparently that's really embarrassing but we gave them an old flip phone because that way like if he was at a friend's house right. well basically he'd fallen off his bike and got hurt and he was riding with friends and so there were luckily there's a parent there but I thought well, what if that happened when he was riding it and there wasn't a parent and so we yeah. gave him a flip phone and apparently that's really embarrassing a flip oh. phone <laughs> and then so we eventually we told him he had to be 11 before he got a smartphone yeah. same thing we put all these controls like he can't get any app without without me getting a notification sure so social media, like yeah, we haven't we haven't crossed that bridge yet on the age. I, I I think I 
think it was um, one of the past interviews. He's talking about how he followed his his boy's mm, Instagram. And, right. And his friends was posting stuff oh, yeah. on his Instagram or tagging him. And right. Said, we, we won't let you do that in the house. <laughs> We're not going to let you do it on your social yeah, media. Right. Kind of thing. And, yeah. and it's almost sitting down and, and creating the contract of... of Terms and conditions. That's kind good, of right? That's really smart to do that. Kind of a big deal on, on, and, and it wasn't to that point. They didn't actually hmm. print out one. Right. But it's almost that clear. But that's a good idea, even if you have one printed out. Actually, yeah, that's not a bad idea. <laughs> and, and it'd be interesting too to, to sit down with the, your kid and say, "Look, help me create this." Mm-hmm. And then they get their input in right. it. They felt like they have ownership of it, and they almost hold themselves more accountable. Definitely. Or, or not probably not in every case, but at least feeling ownership oh, in their agreement. That's, you know, ownership is huge with kids. If they yeah. feel like they were part of the decision, they're more apt to, to follow sure. whatever it was that you implemented. Video games? So video games, um, my kid, I do let my kids, is that what the question is? Yeah. <laughs> I do play video games or, say, or, do, I, or do I play video <laughs> games? I do not. Um, but they play Minecraft, so they okay. do like Minecraft. And I actually like that one because it is um, a lot of creativity. So they're learning so much with it. So, um, yeah, we do have some video games that they play with. Educational games? Well, to me, even Minecraft is a little educational. Sure, but sure. no, I mean, at they're at the age now, I used to have, like, I used to have a subscription. I can't remember the website now, but it was all these educational games. Yeah. They're on me now. Like, seriously, Mom, like, <laughs> I can play this. So kind of past that age where I can kind yeah. of, like, sneak that in. of like, this is fun. This yeah. is just a game when it's, like, learning how to spell. So I can't do it as much anymore. But I liked Minecraft. I pushed for that one because I'm like, at least that one's creative. Right. And they have fun. And they have fun. Exactly. It's not like a World of Warcraft. Right. Right. Well, I did love my oldest son, Guitar Hero, because he likes to play electric guitar. So like, that one, you know, all right, that's still, I'm good with that one. Right. And what about the other... uh, Maybe what they get from school. Does school incorporate technologies? With you know, education? their school right now doesn't as much. Like, they have, I know years past, like, they've had logins to different websites where they're supposed to complete some of their assignments. But this is the first year we haven't really had much. And I know other parents that have quite a bit. So it just, I know it's school by school. Mm-hmm. And then you ever, I think one of the things that I'm not looking forward to is the day that, that my kid is in a math class that's beyond my it my happens. experience. Uh, I don't know, 11, but it seems like it's it's already advanced so much. Oh my goodness. No, it's... I'm good at math, or at least yeah. I thought, because I'm the one in our house that does the homework with the boys. Sure. My I'm all about school, and my husband's about sports, and so I'm now at the point... And it's bad. Like, and we have uh, Amazon Alexa at home too, okay. you know. And so I like there was a problem. I actually asked, <laughs> I asked Alexa how to do it, and I'll have to Google sometimes because he he does Singapore math. Oh wow! And um, I don't even know what that is. Exactly. Right. Exactly. <laughs> and it's like I look at it, and I'll start doing one of his problems, and I'm doing an algebraic equation, and he's like, "No, that's not right. It has to be Singapore math, which is like a certain way you set it up, and they're like these." Yeah, exactly. So there's, I'm like, I don't know. I only know how to do it this way. Like, I can't train my brain the other way. And so there's been times I've finally had to Google it. Cause like, I don't know. Like, okay. let me just Google it and see. But there actually was one time, and I totally will admit this and embarrass myself, but there was a math problem I, like, literally could not figure out. And I thought, he's in fifth grade. And then I was really hard on myself. I'm like, I'm working on my PhD, and I can't tell my fifth grade son with this math question. Like, but then I was talking to other moms, and, like, no one could do it. So I actually felt better about myself after that. That's right. It's <laughs> an impossible question. Right. I, I was thinking about things like the Khan Academy and oh, the resources right. online for that. Right. Yeah, I guess I could have done that, too. So I, I, don't, I don't know, because I've, I've turned to it recently for me because I wanted to improve my my writing right and so I started looking on Khan Academy and they have stuff they do resources plenty of it okay. lynda.com right, Lin- a bunch of them Linda's great I haven't yeah. looked up Singapore math I should because that's what I struggle with is uh, Singapore math maybe I should look that up maybe I should look it up before my kid gets oh it. my goodness well it was <laughs> easy in the beginning a lot of it was like oh I got this yeah. this is like it just has a fancy name it's not a big deal but now that I'm in fifth grade I'm like okay I don't I don't have this <laughs> wow that's so that's exciting right that the kids are advancing at this rate. Absolutely. And, and, you know, we hear a lot of negativity about education, but, man, Mm -hmm. 
they, they are, are learning. Right, they are. Yes. And they're savvy. And I think yeah. part of that is technology. I mean, because yeah. techno- to use technology, I mean, you have to be you have to be have some analytical abilities and so i think it fosters that quite a bit mm-hmm. i mean i knew like i knew there was one day like i had had my ipad for a while and apparently i didn't even know how to make folders in there i didn't even know that was an option because i just had gotten it and my uh-huh. son at that time he's like in kindergarten he like sits down with my ipad and organizes the whole thing <laughs> like that's me feel old <laughs> but that's kids though you know and they yeah. are more savvy than ever before because i think they're not afraid to try things too sure. and that's a huge thing yeah, it's, it's amazing to see the curiosity right. and the discovery. Absolutely. Explains. Makes me want to be a kid again. I know, I know. <laughs> Instead of thinking I know everything, right. to just discover new things. No. That's cool. What What's your own personal use with, with um, well, let's say, technology and social media? I mean, I'm... I'm it's like I'm married to it. Right. <laughs> like, you know, for what I do, I'm always, always doing something. So on the social networks, I have, like, I very much focus on, like, personal branding, but then also business branding. Mm-hmm. And so I do both. So I'm, I'm very active there. Mm-hmm. But even with that, I've tried to put some parameters over, like, what I do that's personal, like, mm-hmm. just for my family versus, and that's hard. I think that's yeah. really hard, especially from a digital marketing perspective, because you need to be out there. Yeah. Um, but that's a whole other can of worms. We don't need to open that one. <laughs> but um, technology, like, I actually, I mean, I'm always... Yeah, I'm always on my computer. I'm always on my phone. Mm-hmm. But it's interesting. So I actually want to spin it a little bit and tell you something I told my class today. Because I'm always doing that, like, yeah. I actually like to read a paper book. Okay. And I get the newspaper on Sunday. And I also like magazines. And I think part of that's being in the digital world. You just sometimes need a break. And so sometimes I just have to, like, cut for me, like, okay, I just need to, like, be old school. Yeah. And there's the training that I was talking about doing. Like, sometimes um, I'll... Like there was one time I made a joke about, and I was actually not making a joke. Take it back. They thought I was making a joke. I said something about like going to the library. Like I, I love the library. Mm-hmm. They looked. They thought that was funny. Really? <laughs> like no, I wasn't joking. I was being serious. I like books, and so. But technology still has to be a big part. So I use tools. Like going back to that, there's a ton of tools that I use because I'm always having to dig into data, and understand like what's going on there. What's your top? Three go-to tools. Besides um, the one you already told us about. Okay, so there, yeah, there's already that one. Um, I use the SEM Rush for SEO. Um, of course, I live in Google Analytics. Uh-huh. I mean, and then Google Search Console. I'll, I'll group those two together. So those, okay. so then I can have a third one. Good. <laughs> and then um, my third one, actually, that I use all the time, is a tool called Majestic. Mm-hmm. And so what Majestic does is it monitors your um, what's called authority and or your trust and citation flow. Mm -hmm. And that is based on authority. So like how many sites are linking to yours? Are they uh, trustworthy? Are they Mm -hmm. authoritative? Because in the online world, still to this day, those links are pretty much a vote in your credibility. And you want to, and they connect you to either a good neighborhood online or a bad neighborhood Mm -hmm. online. So I'm always monitoring what's going on there. So those are the ones like I'm on all the time, all the time. I think I heard it, and this was a while ago, it might be different now, but that if you can get an EDU to link to your website, it's like the top. Right. It used to be. like So like the golden links is what we used to call them, or like the .gov, the .org, and .edu. Not so much anymore. Now what Google cares about is, is it a relevant link? Like, Um, should they be linking to you? Does it make sense for them to be linking to you? Is it organic? Which also goes with relevancy. So it's, it's changed a little bit, but it used to be that way. I had one client in the agency I was at, and he taught um, part-time at a university. And so he uh, had the school through his bio because we're like, you need a .edu link. And so mm-hmm. through his bio, he ended up linking to his business uh-huh. website. And back in the day, like literally, he got a boost immediately. Wow. That doesn't happen anymore. Okay. That, it doesn't work that way anymore. Well, that's good to know. I won't right. try to do that right. anymore. <laughs> anymore. Mental it, unless it makes sense. <laughs> unless it makes sense. Yeah. Right. That's cool. So books, you like to read books. What... Mm-hmm. What's your top, uh, when somebody says, what's a good book to read? Okay, so as far as like the business books, like I love Tipping Point is one of my favorite ones. So, right, yep, so I love that book. I'm trying to think of what's on my shelf. I like, um, so ASU, since you're going to ASU, I like uh, Dr. Robert Cialdini's books. Yes. So Influence, and then I just ordered his new one. Persuasion. Persuasion. So I was watching a video on that. I actually showed my class this video of him talking about it. So I haven't 
read it yet, but yeah. I have it on my shelf to read next. But I love, um, that's not like a lot of that's what pushed me to go on the psychology side because I love any book that's like talking about you know, like influence yes. and motivation and like digging deep into what's causing people to do certain things. So Cialdini is why I went to ASU. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay. That's awesome. I heard him speak at a conference and just like immediately bought his book. Wow. That's great. Yeah. It, uh, it was, I was applying for, for master's programs and I was in a persuasion class in undergraduate studies and and it was the second time I was going through his book I read mm -hmm. it for fun before and we were doing it for right. the class and so I thought I wonder where he's from what's his bio <laughs> I didn't read it the first time I was reading right. ASU I was like okay I'll check out Arizona <laughs> I didn't want to go to the heat right. but oh, then I really? found this program no and way. it felt right no way That's and I great. even took a doctoral level persuasion class with really? Dr. Mungu and, and he was uh He's written things for the, uh -huh. the persuasion and right there with right. Cialdini. And it's the closest I can get to yeah. Cialdini. We even studied Cialdini in, in the class there. That's great. Yeah, so it was an awesome <laughs> experience. So I'm glad that you brought that up. Right. I haven't got the persuasion by one. I just got it. I mean, I haven't read it yet, but I'm yeah. like, it's on my list to read it's next. It's <laughs> so fascinating that the human psychology mm -hmm. and how we do things. That exactly. Rationally or rational or irrationally rational. Mm -hmm. That's another mm -hmm. author. Oh, MIT right. Yeah, that absolutely. That's, that's a really fun read. I, I have that right up there with, with Shelby. Mm -hmm. um, and then fun reads. This is just. I know. Let me think of what I've read. Gosh, it's been so long since I've read how to like a fun read because my PhD <laughs> program, I'm like so burned out after I've read like, you know, 100 pages on something right. that I'm like, oh my gosh. Um, oh, what book? Actually, so this is going to be more like cliche, but I loved that book, Gone Girl. That was probably one of the last ones I read. Yeah, mm -hmm. so not necessarily like the literature classics um, that I would say, but that was one of the most recent ones. I like ones that just make you think. Yeah. And like you think about after you finish reading it, you're like, and that book actually, like, after I got to a certain point, I like went back and read from like, I'm like, wait, what happened? <laughs> and so. <laughs> And it's, other than that, it's been so long yeah. since I read something that was just like for fun because I just, uh, I just don't have the time. I have a stack of books, but I couldn't even tell you what the titles are. Sure. I'll get to them eventually well, in two years. Yeah, in two <laughs> years. But it's, but the thing is like, I make a point to read like the business type books or yeah. the psychology books because I'm like, you know, I can apply that. It's the other ones that I'm just like, right. if I need to just shut down and like not have to think too hard, a book is just, or reading is just not it anymore. Yeah. <laughs> it used to be. Smartphone? Do you have? Um, I have an iPhone. Okay. And so, what apps would you say are, are help you be efficient in life? Things. things. You know that one? It's called Things. It's like literally just a to do list, and it's okay. like you can categorize it and schedule it and all of that. And that's like, I mean, I live by that. If it's not in Things, it's going to be a problem. <laughs> <laughs> and so I put it in Things, and then um, that between that one and Evernote. Those okay. are the two that I use like the most as far as efficiency goes, yeah. you know, because like I'll be somewhere and I'll be like, oh, I don't want to forget that. Or I just get a really good thought. You know how it is. Sometimes right. you get a really good idea. It might not come back. You need to write it down. And so, I mean, those are the ones that I use a lot. I try getting to Evernote, but I just... You couldn't do it. I haven't. It, it never stuck. It didn't. Yeah. I mean, once you get into it, because then if you're on multiple, and I know you're on multiple, yeah, multiple yeah. Apple devices, it's going to sync up too. Sure. I think I do notes and, and right. it syncs up for me. Yeah. And, but I'll, I'll take a look at, at Evernote and things. Again, right. Things, yeah. Things, things is just an app. But it's, I like it. It's just simple. Yeah. And then you schedule things. So I know, like, because I have so much going on with, like, school and everything yeah. and teaching is that I take each day at a time. So whatever pops up for the mm -hmm. next day, I'm like, okay, I'll just worry about it when I see it in the morning and it pops up in things. Yeah. So that's pretty good. Awesome. Well, I think that's a thorough... Um, thorough understanding of your background. Mm -hmm. Any other last things you want to add as far as technology or SEO or I feel like we've covered quote we've covered a lot of a ground lot of stuff. Right. Like, this is going to be one of those that, I, that I'm going to listen to multiple times <laughs> and have to take notes on well we end every show with with two questions okay. for it's more fun nostalgic right. and so we'll have you tell me what your favorite technology was growing up and second what your uh, what technology you're most excited for okay so my favorite technology which is going to totally date me was the original Nintendo <laughs> when that came out I was so excited and I was glued to that thing like I would play Mario Brothers like because it was in the summer all day every day where I'd fall asleep like with the little tune going through my head <laughs> so 
that was my favorite as a kid. Uh -huh. And then as far as what I'm most excited about is actually virtual reality. I'm very, very intrigued because I just think that's going to be just, it's going to impact a lot of our lives going forward. And I mean, the technology is already there and we, we're seeing it in different areas, mm -hmm. um, but it's going to just grow. And I'm actually, that excites me a lot. Awesome. Anything specific about the VR that you're looking forward to? I think, well, this is just my guess, you know, is that we're going to get to the point where, you know what, we want we want to attend the conference, but we can't go there. Well, yeah. we can be there virtually. Like, that's the kind of stuff. I think that's coming. And that's, I think that's, well, that's the part that gets me excited. Yeah. So, I mean, I'd still want to, like, actually go to, like, Hawaii or something like virtual <laughs> <that's laughs> reality in Hawaii. But, like, you know, I think it's going to open up more opportunities for us to experience things we never would be able to experience without it. Yeah. So that's the part that gets me excited. That's awesome. Mindy, thank you so much for your time. And you are uh, welcome. people want to look you up, what's the best place to go Okay, so um, you can go to my website because I'm like, there's contact information on there and it's marketmindshift.com um, or on Twitter. So my Twitter handle is Mindy with a Y, uh, D Weinstein. So that's W E. I N S T E I N. Actually, I had to think about how to spell my own last name. <laughs> but either one, um, but I'm, I'm very active on Twitter too. So either okay. one's great. Awesome. Thank you so much for your time. I right. really appreciate it. You're welcome. Open angle bracket forward slash HTML close angle bracket.